we'll go ahead and get started on our uh, work session and welcome everybody and he said I'm supposed to review the board agenda for tomorrow for Monday anybody see anything that jumps out at them we need to do or anything talk about See anything? We got our face covering vote. That's good. Required by law. All right. You can always amend the agenda before you approve. It. That's correct. All right. If you see anything, it's uh, have questions on, and you can talk to me later, or talk to Doctor Bill, or we'll go ahead and get started. I think Ms. Wood is up next. I think I'm on now. I'm going to start with the current calendar 21-22 and I just want to um, ask for your approval. We are going to add two early release days into the second semester to accommodate for our elementary school teachers letters training and Jill and Dr. Nolte can speak more about the training specifically if you want to know that but we have added um, March the 4th and April the 1st as early release days specifically for that training. We did not um, take our January 5th or our April 8th early, early release day to do that because those are already in our weather plan and we may need to use those. Okay. Well, we'll do something about that Monday night. Any questions for anybody? All right. Okay, now moving on to the 2022-23 school year ca calendar. So the calendar committee met in September, October, and November, and they are going to recommend a calendar that I have marked. I think it says calendar committee recommends on your copy. It says recommended by calendar committee. Yeah, okay, same one. This is the calendar that they have developed and um, want me to bring before the board. Dr. Nolte, Jill and I um, have some issues with this calendar and so I want to explain that to you and you'll see the other draft which is the calendar that we um, are going to recommend I guess. And so the first issue with the calendar is in fall break and if you look at the difference in those, the fall break that the calendar committee is recommending is only a remote learning optional work day which means that that is in the fall break for employees but not for students students will still have to do work on that day because they will have uh, front-loaded assignments and we count instructional time on that day and the second issue that we have with the calendar is this December 23rd work day um, for several reasons high schools have to test the last five days of the semester which includes that day or includes includes the last five days so if we use this calendar that means they would start testing on friday the 16th and then continue into the next week um also we we don't want to we we it's hard for us in the first semester because of the number of instructional hours that we have so I really try to protect those hours in that first semester and we want to test before Christmas and so if you look at the draft that we have um, come up with it's we put an early release day there on the 23rd and move the optional work day back to the fall break so that's a fall break for everyone kids and employees we do have an early release day on the 23rd which cuts more time instructional time off it is three hours it is not ideal for me um, but I will compromise on this school year calendar because we can't start students can't start before the Monday closest to August 19th which in this calendar pushes it out to the following week um, some we some years we get lucky and the Monday is prior to the 19th and then with this school year um, Christmas Day is on a Sunday which makes it a little hard to um, when it's in the middle of the week you have about an equal a few days before Christmas and then 
uh, time after Christmas as well. But in this calendar, the bulk of Christmas vacation or holiday, the holiday break is after Christmas. Let me add a couple comments, Jenny. I think you did a great job. On the uh, proposed calendar for next year, uh, additional objections uh, were that uh, it seemed like an excessive uh, Christmas break if there can be such a thing. All right. I remember in the good old days uh, when we tested way after Christmas, which is not necessarily beneficial for the social and emotional and mental health of students and teachers, nor does it really improve the uh, uh, grades as we've noticed. But uh, we, you know, we'd have 10 days or so, week, week and a half. Because we're trying to um, test at the end of uh, uh, December before the Christmas holiday break, uh, it seemed a little excessive, at least to me, that we would take off the 23rd and then the next two complete weeks. Uh, so in addition to messing up the testing schedule um, and um, having a fall break only for staff, we just, those were, you know, those were the things. We were very transparent. Um, with the calendar committee it was uh, in complete fairness to the calendar committee uh, representatives they were there not always speaking for themselves but representing their schools most of the schools are middle schools and elementary schools and they don't have at least staff concerns as many staff concerns about high school testing they they i'm not saying they don't care about them they certainly do but that was not um, in the forefront of their mind and I'd say maybe 75 or 80 percent of them uh, were in favor of the draft that they sent you. But we were very transparent, told them that we did not disagree with that, or did not agree with that, did not know what the board would do, but told them that we would uh, express our concerns to the board and ask you all to consider a different draft. In developing the different draft, we actually met with principals and talk to them in groups. Jenny led those discussions, elementary, middle, and high school. And what we brought you seemed to be a reasonable compromise to uh, protect the integrity of the first semester time, get the testing in, and not start on a Friday, and then have a, a fall break that would be equitable for everyone. So just, I know I repeated some of what Jenny said, but I wanted to let you know, um, why they voted the way that they did and that we were very transparent with them sent an email to the to the calendar committee members and and uh, told them that we would be recommending something different and that we hoped you would uh, go with what we recommend so we'll entertain any questions if you all have them <laughs> yes i have one <clears throat> well first of all if we have a committee whatever comes out of committee is usually what we vote on so I just don't understand. I mean, I understand your reasoning. Now, what was the principles? Did you say they agreed with the one that come out committee or this one, and then explain a 90-day 90, 90 testing again? Well, we, we don't have 90 days in the first semester. We have, uh, in a good year, maybe 84, uh, some years less than that. But we, we are fairly confident that since we went to the hourly calendar, We've not lost any ground. As a matter of fact, both our schools have done really, really well. Uh, and we, we also know there's more than just the test score. There's the uh, social and, uh, and emotional well-being of students and staff when they know they have checked the box, unless we have a snowstorm or something at the last minute. They have checked the box on the first semester. They can go be with their family and friends, come back and start basically a new school year and a second semester over. We do the vast majority of time uh, uh, just bring to you the calendar committee's recommendation. Uh, the, as Jenny said earlier, if um, the 19th, the first day of school were on a Wednesday, we would get to start on Monday and we'd gain, we'd get started on the 17th, so we'd gain a couple days there. Also, when, 
when Christmas Day and New Year's Day fall in the middle of the week. We can typically uh, end the Friday before that and people have a little more time. They don't have more days off necessarily, but they feel like they have a little more time to you know, drive to Alabama or um, host the turkey or whatever they're going to do. This is just a year where the calendar itself made it very difficult um, to meet um, all of the vacation time that was expected and maintain the uh, academic integrity at the high school. And we just felt like uh, the three of us in particular, you know, Jill being the, the curriculum person and um, Jenny managing the calendar and making sure we have ample hours in the first semester, that we had to object to, to that. Yes, sir. And the staff can still take off, you know, use their own annual leave on the 22nd or 23rd if they want to. Well, they can definitely take off very easily on the afternoon of the 23rd unless they're a high school teacher given a makeup test. Uh, and we do have makeup tests. Sometimes students are sick on the first day or they have extended time or multiple sessions. So they certainly could use leave time. Um, that was. Uh, uh, there are situations where principals can approve um, people taking off, but you know we can't have 60 or 70 right. taking off. We have another presentation that we've already had once before in a minute about the substitute uh, development plan. Perfect. But yeah, personally, right. yeah, that's right. Personally, yeah, okay, personally. Excuse me, I'm um, use the wrong terminology. Thank you. But I would, you know, just encourage you to think about this between now and Monday. Certainly we are going to honor uh, whichever one you vote for, but you know we administratively would recommend the one, um, the draft two, we think it is still fair, especially at fall break. And uh, we think there's enough wiggle room there at Christmas that if people really need to drive you know, to Alabama or wherever they're going. One thing I did notice, um, the calendar committee draft does not reflect the letters training early release days in the second semester, but that will be on either calendar um, on uh, March the 3rd and April the 7th. Those will both be early release days next year as well for letters training. Okay, so April the 7th. April the 7th and March the 9th will be letters. It's on the calendar draft that um, Dr. Nolte, Jill, and I I presented, but it is not on the calendar committee, but it should be. Okay, so that's March the 3rd. And Jill can tell you more about that training. It is required by the state and it is very extensive. Um, and we've got um, on the March 10th is a remote learning day as well. But that's in the weather plan. Um, and, and that's on both calendars. That, that one usually doesn't get to stay there. We, we usually gobble that one up for a snow day. Uh, both of those days um, in February and in March are often used earlier for snow makeup. And I know you probably, guys probably remember, but um, it is very hard to um, take any more time away in the first semester because of the amount of instructional time that we need. Um, and so uh, me giving that three hours or compromising with that early release date on the 23rd will not become a habit, but hopefully it will not have to in following years when we have more, a little bit more flexibility with the way Christmas falls and the way the Monday closest to August 19th falls. I have the, the calendar committee so it, it's a representative from every school, and it could be a teacher, teacher assistant, administrator, or a representative of who they, um, whoever the principal assigns to that. And then we have some community people, um, Mr. Francis, Allison Francis, Stephen Sharp, um, Joe Barker, Dr. Nolte, myself. And uh, I, you know, Dr. Nolte did say this but um it when we go around and we each each person presents back what they um 
have gotten feedback from from their school or department it was about 80 percent were in favor of this even though i i was very um, clear about it not being a fall break for students they were still in favor of that and we we had some parent objections about that yes the community was not in favor of that let me i got several emails from the community that wasn't that um so basically the the teachers the feedback that they got and reported was they were more in favor of getting that day off before christmas than getting the, than the fall break yes. it's sort of the, right. how they weighed it and what happens if you do that is um, the high school testing and you usually do your more critical assessments first start on friday and then you have a weekend and you roll in Monday morning and take another critical test and it's just tough uh, what we're doing this year is a split week but it's much more manageable you have three days before the weekend and you can knock out you know English 2 biology math 1 those kinds of things and do more of your makeups and other assessments uh, teacher made tests and so forth um, at the end it's just the perfect storm with where the days fell. And uh, I, I was really tempted during the calendar committee meetings to try to strong arm, but that defeats the purpose of having a committee, to be honest <laughs> with you. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're smart people, and I think on any other year where the 19th fell on a Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, or the New Year's or Christmas fell in the middle of the week, we wouldn't have had this discussion. It would have fallen out, and we would have had a very large consensus on what it should look like. Did they get to see this other this other one before or during while they were working on it? The calendar committee. The calendar committee did not see the draft that we came up with, but all the principals did. Um, we did not meet again after because they wanted me to re recommend this so the process is that i recommend what they or that i bring to you what they recommend that's the process both i'm going to bring both of them calendar <laughs> committee recommendations yeah, she, she's going to bring those and first. i'm going to say to you i recommend the other one and then if we turn this one down then she can recommend this one to us correct <clears throat> But if we vote on this one, then I just didn't know if there would have been some benefit for them to have. I mean, I guess this one was after this one. Well, no, the first reckon the first draft one that they came up with in October was similar to what we we are bringing forth minus the early release date. It was a full day. That was they came back with a different. They came back with this one. Yeah, the initial draft looked a lot like the one administratively we're recommending. Again, I think the hang-up was the Christmas break for them. And it comes down to a three-hour, really, three-hour day on the 23rd. Yeah, that's, all, that's all I see is three. And a fall break. Yeah, and a fall break. Well, the problem is yeah. more than that. Dr. Bill just said that the testing's the hang up yeah well i know That's but i'm the, saying as far as the community oh yeah, as far as the but it, you know we're here for the students is my understanding right it's all about the test it's i really think it's test. about the kids and yeah. and i think that what we got away heavily is the the testing in my mind is trumps about everything that we you know if you <laughs> and i think the beauty of it is most years you don't have this problem no but you know the, the the days fall more toward the middle of the week and that gives you a good bit of wiggle this would and this would give our kids a better opportunity on the test and correct Jill is that right Ms. Barker you know I feel like I've been a principal at a high school and an elementary school and I understand that that Friday I mean the next day is Christmas Eve I, I get that and that yeah. makes it tough but we are bound by law to test the last five days of school and what happens to be transparent like dr nolte most of your tests in high school are done you know the first three days and so i think what a lot of people in the community say well the high school kids are gone yeah. already and um then the elementary kids are still in school and and i understand that because i've lived that elementary side too but being in the high school 
what people don't see are that there's a lot of testing still going on. There are makeup tests, there are tests at extended time and days, and there's a lot of closure. We start school again in January, the first day back, we start a new semester. There's a lot going on there. Um, yes. These grades have to be turned around. Our staff has to score, get those back to them. They have to make placement decisions change student schedules and there's a couple of work days after Christmas but you want that behind you and a lot of closure before you leave so I understand wanting that day before Christmas I think we'd all like to have that but as far as the high school testing that makes it really tough and and Dr. Bill was good and when we talked to the principals most of them have been in a high school at some <laughs> point or, or worked worked in one and, and they understand that too because they get 10 days to test at the end of the year elementary and middle schools high schools get five so it's just you know they understand too they would not want to begin testing on a friday they would not they our principals understand that no matter where they are up and down you know they don't they don't want to test the tuesday after memorial day you know we've been in that before too to give that day so I thought what the principals and Jeannie and Dr. Bill, but I think that was a compromise having that early dismissal on that Friday um, is what the principals all, were they in agreement to that? I felt like they felt all good about that. Mr. Burnett, um, when I emailed the calendar committee back to tell them that I was gonna recommend or bring forth their recommendation, but that we were not in agreement with that, I did get some questions from um, the calendar committee and so I answered them with the same explanation that we've given tonight and they didn't have any response to that. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. One of the uh, one of the budget proposals had suggested that if the school system did not teach cursive writing and the multiplication tables when they were supposed to be taught, that the state could withhold the superintendent's salary. Okay, that did not make it into the budget, into the final budget. But there are things like that that are uh, in the budget, even though they may not be uh, money that's giving. There there are sometimes things that where money is taken away. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to read all of this. So um, there's really good news uh, in the budget, and we're very happy about it. We do think it will make creating a local current expense budget in uh, February and March and April pretty interesting because we'll have to make sure we can pay for all the pay raises that the state authorized. But I just want to say, and I'll repeat a little bit of this on Monday, maybe not take as much time in the regular meeting. We're very happy that for the first time in many, many years, there are comprehensive pay raises and bonuses up and down the line. Those of you who've been on the board for a while know that some years they'll give us a little pay raise for bus drivers and that's it, or they'll give us a pay raise for teachers, or maybe they'll just give us a pay raise for young teachers. And then some years they'll throw in um, they may throw in assistant principals or a central office. This budget has a pay raise for just about everybody I can think of, and that's good. Uh, it'll be fun making the budget, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it to 
to make sure we can pay for all of them. So very quickly, if you'll just stop me um, so we don't spend too much time on this, but the first one is a 5% pay raise for teachers over a two-year period. So about half of that each year. And you all know how that goes. Some steps on the pay scale get a little more than others. Typically, the younger you are, the bigger pay raise you get. And then when you get older like me, they, they don't give you as much, all right, because they know you're sort of locked in. But that is, uh, that's uh, really pretty cool. Same thing for principals, and they will just adjust their scale. You know, principals are paid by the size of their school. It will be on average 5% over a, over a uh, uh, two-year period plus a one-time bonus uh, instead of the performance bonus. You know, teachers and principals both got performance bonuses if they made growth, and because they haven't given growth in a couple years and they're not going to this year, um, you know, from last year's uh, figures that weren't published, they're going to just give them a, a general bonus there. I'll talk to you a little bit more um, about when all this is paid in just a second. Non-certified people, basically across the board, if you're an hourly person, the pay will go to $13 an hour at a minimum this school year, and that pay will be retroactive. Now, don't, don't ask me all the details yet because it's still trickling in from the state. And how does that fit into retirement and the orbit system and everything else? And then next year, it will go to a minimum of $15 an hour during the 22-23 school year. So um, proud of the state for stepping up and doing that. Very happy for our employees in that area. Central office, this is amazing, OK? I'm being a little facetious, but a little serious, too, because central office tweaks have been very meek uh, through the years. Also. Uh, about two and a half percent on average this school year and another two and a half percent on average uh, next school year instructional personnel these are people with a teaching license but they're not necessarily in a the classroom there are some uh, monthly um, supplements for those people you can see those and uh, one of my retired buddies, when the budget was released, called me up and said, did I get a pay uh, increase as a retired person? And I said, I don't know. Look it up yourself. But he knows who he is if he goes back and listens to this recording. So we think most of that first page, because the way the legislation reads, um, uh, will be paid probably in February. It looks like most of the rules around most of this money will have the bonus items paid at the end of January. Uh, the retro pay, uh, going back to the first of the year for pay increases, most of that will occur in February. And then you know in March is when we have our local supplement. So say a little prayer for the finance and payroll department. I think they can do it. They've worked very, very hard um, uh, over the last couple years. But that looks like the payout times. Uh, on this next page, um, uh, provides a $1,000 bonus for all full-time local education employees and state uh, uh, employees, regardless of their funding source. So this is an area where it looks like the state's going to give us money for all the employees. Uh, they don't necessarily do that in all of them. And then an additional 500, I think this is really neat, if you make less than 75,000 a year. So that bonus, um, which is essentially a COVID kind of bonus, similar to what we did with our, with our federal funds, is higher for our lower paid employees. And I think that's good. You know, we went out of the way when we developed ours to make sure it didn't matter what your job description was. If you were full-time, you got the same amount. Didn't matter what your job description was or if you were part-time. Um, they're also doing with teachers what they did with principals and taking the usual growth bonus and giving them a one-time stipend, um, providing another 
different kind of COVID bonus for teachers who have received a certain type of training related to COVID. Here's the neat thing. We think a lot of people may be scrambling around trying to figure out the trainings. We were trying to figure out how are we going to know which teachers got which training and so we can give them this bonus. And it didn't take long to realize, well, that's all we've done during our staff development days at the beginning of the year. So we can literally just print that list of people who attended and print those agendas. So there's a, a training bonus there um, related to COVID. Um, there is a teacher supplemental assistance allotment. And this is um, an allotment to school systems uh, to help uh, with paying teachers. And it, uh, we are eligible, but very large areas with the greater than $40 billion in local uh, assets are not eligible. We thought that was interesting. Buncombe, Durham, Guilford, um, Mecklenburg, Charlotte Meck, and Wake are not eligible for that. And then low wealth at the bottom does not apply to us. Any questions about that? I'm going really quickly. Go into the teacher supplement assistance there a little bit more. Explain who would qualify for that. Or um, Well, all of our teachers are going to qualify, and we'll take that money and, and dish it out appropriately based upon, you know, where they are. Um, and we'll use that for supplemental assistance to help with supplements okay okay ask one question on the COVID bonuses it says from federal ESSER funds is that additional ESSER funds we receive or is that what it, it, lot of money we already have it is uh, you know that we agreed to give you all a, a periodic ESSER update and maybe three times a year and I have one for you tonight we did one I think maybe in September or October um, and it's actually a new PRC, starts with a 200 number, so it is a separate line there, which is neat. No, if they're going to make you try to pull it out of the funds you've already got, that's no, no, doesn't look like it. It's good. Doesn't look like it. So these you. We think most of these bonuses will need to be paid in January because each little section of the law is written a little differently. Part of our concern is we don't have the money yet, right? But we do have, uh, with a lot of these bonuses, the description written in that they would be paid by January 31st. And if we're going to pay some of them, try to knock out the bonuses in January and then the retro pay in February. Good questions. Anything else about that sheet? Okay, cool. Now, this is just a really good picture. We, we come to you every year and go, oh, the benefit costs have gone up, the benefit costs have gone up, and you say that sometimes to the media and to other people who ask questions, and they look at you like, you know, how much is that? So this is a real clear picture of the benefit cost uh, currently um, in, uh, or last year, last year for the 2021 year, the retirement was calculated at 21.65% of the salary. That's a big chunk. And the hospitalization was 6,326 bucks per employee. I mean, that's you just paid that right up front before you ever paid them a penny. Uh, for the current year, that 63.26 has moved to 7,019. And next year, in 22-23, it has moved to um, uh, 7,397, and you can see that the retirement percentages have also creeped up. And that adds up in a hurry when you have a thousand employees. So that's just a ton. That's just a ton of money. Okay. Any questions about that? Um, Really good news on the, sec on the next page. I actually got this after the budget was voted on, but I received this from the uh, superintendents and principals professional organization, and I think it's accurate, but I, I, it's, so, it's almost like a, 
a Christmas present, so I'm still holding my breath. The ADM adjustment, which is basically the hold harmless for what we should normally have in students and for those who are actually here, and you know almost every school system in the state is down a significant number of students. We're down almost 500 between what we should normally have and, um, and, and the, the number that's actually here. But on the state side, uh, it, it, the state has set aside 3.6 million in recurring money, which it'll be there for these two school years, for this year and next year to hold us harmless on our enrollment. That is awesome. Okay. especially when we're trying to uh, make sure everybody who got a pay raise from the state gets that pay raise. Um, so that's, that's really, really awesome. Um, that will go away sometime, board members, and we'll have a, we'll have a different story. We, won't, we will not be calling that awesome when that goes away. And hopefully our students will return and we'll be back over 700 instead of over 6,500. 7,000 instead of over 6,500, okay? And there, um, there are lots of other uh, little things in there. Next page quickly. Uh, we serve about 18% of our students in special needs with an IEP of some sort. The state has funded us for a long time at 17.75% and they are taking that to 13%. That will help just a little, uh, but we still, we still serve students with identified handicapping conditions and serve more than we get funded for because we think we need, they need that service and they're entitled to it. Um, page 17 by number, I don't think I've, I've given you that many pages. We came to you all a couple years ago and um, talked about searching for a business system moderniz modern modernization software plan package. We, we actually uh, looked at available companies and selected, I think, Cherry Road. The two companies were Tyler and Cherry Road. and. Um, we're prepared to move to that system that is much more modern than what we currently use now in HR and finance. Uh, we had um, a ransomware attack. We had some health issues in our uh, finance department and COVID hit. So we went, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're just trying to feed people and teach them and we have not done that. And a lot of other school systems did the same thing. So as part of the budget, the state has basically said, you're going to do this and you're going to do this soon if you want us, the state, to pay for it. So uh, the state has set aside uh, almost 49 million in non-recurring, which means it will be there and then it will be gone, funds for 21-22, that's like now. It's right, Mr. Francis is doing this. Yeah, right now. Um, and then 37.8 um, in non-recurring for the following year to advance the plan, okay, with new uh, system integration with payroll and HR and integrated licensure. We have desperately needed that a long time and started making those plans even when Angie was here. I'll talk to you about that. Uh, the next section you'll see requires us to go to a cloud-based system for all public school units effective this year. So if we want the money, we'll probably have to jump on it this year and at least finish it next school year. So we have some preliminary plans for that. We've already selected the vendor. We did that a couple years ago, and there's still just a couple vendors that, um, you know, who are eligible to do that. So we will be coming back to you shortly, probably in January, no later than February, saying, here's our plan. Okay? 
good news and bad news. Good news is that they're going to fund it. Bad news is it's right now and we're still in COVID and paying lots of bonuses, but we'll, you know, we'll make it happen. Um, <clears throat> How long do you think the process will take to get all this moved over? Uh, well, I had, I've had conversations with lots of people about that. John, uh, Jason and I have talked about it several times, Mr. Hines and HR, because that's one of the areas. And then I've talked to Nathan a little bit about it, and I've talked uh, to um, Amanda Robinson, who's uh, serving as our part-time payroll lead right now. We think that's probably a two-year process where um, the company comes in and in less than a year collects all the data we talk and when i say we not me probably amanda and jason mainly and the uh, and i would say that most of this is housed in the technology department kim kim will probably see that money flow through her department when it comes or through line items that she typically manages because it's a software conversion and probably in less than a year they'll gather all the data that they need from the key people in HR and finance and technology and we'll tell them lots of things about how we track money through is and it can be a little different in each school system you know how people take leave and do they do it in chunks of time or do they do it by hours and minutes and all those things and then you know then they'll 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 grab our data and flip a switch and it will be converted now any of you who have done software conversions and and I've had the pleasure working in Haywood County Schools to have done many of those um, from um, the student information system to NCYS to power school they're they're not always 100 <laughs> percent I'm being generous there so it will take, I'm thinking, another six months, maybe to a year, for our local experts to go in there and fix what did not transfer in payroll and HR. So maybe end of next school year, we're getting close. Um, this last sheet was just an example. I also showed principals about some of those funny things I told you about with uh, the, uh, withholding the superintendent's salary didn't make it in there for cursive writing and everything else. Um, they also um, uh, put in the, uh, the, the lifetime teaching license for retirees and provide, they will provide it to more people. It's been essentially mainly for teachers in the past but they're going to expand that when you retire and you have 30 years that you can get a lifetime teaching license if you want it and then the other one that is pretty important for everyone to know about is that when people have taken personal leave in the past if they required a substitute or even if they didn't the local school system was required to subtract $50 from their pay that day to cover part of the substitute. And that is no longer allowed this school year. Uh, I think it's even retroactive. So if we charge someone earlier in the first few months of school, we'll, we'll give them their 50 bucks back. So that's real quick on about a thousand pages of budget. There are two documents um, one's, I guess, closer to 1,100. One's about 600 pages, and one's about 500 pages. So, any questions? Great budget. Happy for our employees. It will make developing our local current expense budget really fun and interesting. Uh, but we'll do it. We've done it before. Any questions about that? I'd like to do a little Monday, but maybe about 20% uh, of that time. That'd Just be great. Give the general public uh, who may not read the newspaper's notes or go back and look at the audio recording. Uh, OSHA order update. I, I don't have a lot of information for you that you probably haven't already heard on uh, the news. But as you know, uh, the federal. Um, 
OSHA agency issued an order that is called a vaccination order, but is primarily, at least in its early stages, a testing order that would require us beginning in January, if it were to come to fruition, uh, to test employees who were not vaccinated uh, it, weekly. We came to you earlier and talked to you about preparing behind the scenes in case we have to do it. I've been working with Sarah Henderson to do some of that prep work and just personally uh, and professionally as a superintendent, I hope we do not have to do that. I'm speaking for myself, not for you, uh, um, but I hope we do not have to do that because I want our school doors to stay open and I am concerned that we would lose a significant number of employees and we just don't want to lose any more than we already have. So there are there were multiple lawsuits filed across the country. Most of them, those were not in our federal jurisdiction, but the courts have ordered that those um, that those lawsuits be settled before uh, the country would move forward in any jurisdiction. So right now we're on hold waiting for what the courts decide. It is my understanding that in North Carolina, the Attorney General would have to act if the lawsuits um, do not prevail. And um, I did send one message to the state AG through Representative Clampett, who I was in a meeting with him about a month ago, to express my personal concerns about the loss of uh, employees being at work and not being able to have school. And um, I had forgotten him that I asked to, to deliver that message. And earlier this week, he called me up and Brooke called down the hall and said, Dr. Note, uh, uh, Representative Clampett's on the phone. I'm like, I ran down there and he said, you told me to tell the AG your message and I did. I'm like, okay, thank you. So we, I did send that message forward. So any questions about OSHA? I think it's a wait and see. Um, and uh, we'll prepare and hope that we don't uh, need to, I personally, again, don't want to speak, speak for you or anyone else, hope that I don't have to implement uh, that testing plan. Any questions or comments about that? Lots of comments, but we'll hold them yeah. Yeah, until, until we have to make them. Yeah, yeah I, I'm dumb enough to say what I think out loud. So, okay. Um, so, uh, it, uh, what we'll do is move to my last item, which is uh, the uh, ESSER update. It's this, uh, this sheet, little bitty lines, put your glasses on, has all the codes on it, that kind of stuff. We gave you an update. and. September or October. Uh, if I could do, I think yours has, has a couple highlighted numbers on them. Mm -hmm. So I did that to give you the perspective on when money came in and how long it is available. Okay, if that makes sense. So from uh, the, the first little number of uh, 122 down to um, 169, I, I highlighted 171 and 180, but it's actually down to 169. That's what uh, most of us affectionately call ESSER 1. All of it's not ESSER money, but all of it is federal money. Some of it is called GEARS money. It flowed through the governor's office and there are other state funds that have come down that originated as COVID federal funds. So from 121 through the end of the 160s, that's the first wave. That money is available uh, through next fall, fall 22, okay? And then from 170 down to 178, uh, that's what we all call ESSER 2, and most of it's labeled that way. That's available through fall 23, and then 181 through 187, that's available through fall, um, almost can't count that high, 24, okay? So part of the dilemma here 
is we knew what we needed to spend on early because we had immediate needs and I'll tell you about show you some of those in just a moment uh, what we don't know is what's going to happen this Christmas New Year Kwanzaa holiday break we just we don't know we had a pretty tough surge last year uh, more people are vaccinated more people have had COVID so we're hopeful that it will be much much better uh, we don't know that we also had a very robust summer um, training uh, or learning recovery for students this last summer hours stretched over nine weeks no one else ne went nearly that long they crammed their required 30 hours into a much shorter piece of time. We were trying to gain learning, so we spread ours out and tried to make the day enjoyable and not have kids so worn out at three o'clock that they wouldn't come back the next day, so we ended in the middle of the day. But we really don't know um, how much we'll need in the next couple summers. Hopefully we can stay in school five days a week a lot and we will need some, but not as much. So a lot of the future expenditures we have in our head, and I can tell you about them, we've talked about them before, HVAC systems and things like that. Uh, and, you know, but in this report, I'm just gonna run over what we have spent. So column number one is basically the purpose code, and I gave you the time period. Column number two is a brief description, and that's the, federal description not necessarily ours and then you have um, it was spent in 2020 and remember we were only in session like March to June so we didn't have a whole lot that year and then it was spent in 2021 through the end of February and so the one two three four five six column of total expenditures is what we have spent thus far. The column next to it, total out, uh, allotment, is what, hey, Dr. Putnam, is what has come in, or you know what will be allocated, and then the balance and the and the amount remaining. So I'm here. I'm going to go really quickly. Y'all know that's I have a problem doing that, but I'm going to go really quickly. So um, summer learning plan. 121 uh, that was the July mainly the 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 July um, uh, summer learning we also did some jump start to get kids in who were high risk and you can see that that particular uh, summer learning program that particular line we spent over a quarter million dollars 266,000 uh, 122 uh, we started spending this year this is where we have begun to hire health support licensed clinical social workers and people like that and we've started paying them a remote instruction um, that's a lot of the um, uh, hot spots and uh, other access things that we have done I will say the total money that has gone to help us get through COVID includes the ESSER, but a lot of people just gave us hot spots and they gave us masks and they gave us hand sanitizer. I don't know that we'll ever really get a grip on the total cost. We'll obviously track this federal stuff and any local funds that we end up spending. Uh, 124. Uh, you know that first year we passed out Chromebooks and we passed out uh, iPads and that um, that amount total expenditure 137,000 um, went to uh, buy some of those and replace some of those and we've had broken screens and lost uh, power cords and all that kind of stuff um, school nutrition that was a special line just for school nutrition and that is where we tried to take our food and make it mobile carts rolling up and down the hall a specialized trailer for transporting food um, to different locations and so we have spent you know literally over 231,000 in that area 
personal computers and devices. Uh, Kim, I don't know if you can help me or not. Those, are those the staff ones? We had to modernize a lot of our staff computers so they could do remote learning that first spring and first summer. And not all of our computers were able to, uh, you know, they didn't have cameras or they didn't have the, I don't know all the technical terms like Kim, but they didn't have all the NARS and RAMs that they needed to do the video stuff. Uh, connectivity for school buses. Uh, that one's zero, sorry. Uh, uh, connectivity and student mobile uh, access. I think that's where we purchased the service, the hotspots and the service. Um, and even with some students, even if you gave them a hotspot, they didn't have the service at their house. Um, exceptional children, um, extended learning grant. Uh, this is where we hired, uh, not hired people, but we took our, some of our 10 month people and they came in and got us caught up on annual reviews and three year reviews and assessing student loss and making sure our IEPs and other things were up to speed. We also had some of those students, if they were willing to come in in person uh, to do some one-on-one -on -one uh, sort of catch up because they were further behind to begin with and had to work really hard not to get uh, more behind. Uh, going down to uh, cyber security, it's pretty handy to have Kim here. That's a little bit of money. What'd you do with that? Buy a server or something? Bought a server with the cyber security. Um, that was helpful following our ransomware attack and that just happened to be in the COVID money. Uh, PEP and uh, equipment and you know what that is that's uh, temperature taking uh, gloves and masks and scanners and again a lot of that stuff was donated through uh, foundations but we all and given to us but we also had uh, to purchase a lot of it hundred and seventy two thousand dollars spent thus far um, and then state COVID uh, supplement funds for um, of $252. You'll notice that one is really the only one that we spent in 2020 where we had March, April, May and closed the school year. You all will remember we received an allotment that was only good for special summer staffing staffing to close the school year from March when we closed down through the summer and and it was only good through June 30th and you all will remember we came up with a plan and when I say we not just administratively but you all working with us and that's where we mobilized the buses and and had custodians and cafeteria workers and uh, clerical people loading the buses and taking food to people and setting up a uh, food distribution uh, locations throughout the community which was really cool I think for a lot of people who were out of out of jobs quickly um, and so that that's that number we didn't quite know what to do with that when we first saw it but we figured it out pretty quickly um, 163 is a very general code had to be spent related to COVID, but we had a lot of options. And my note here to myself is we bought everything with it. We did buy some PPE, and then we, uh, uh, out, out of that line, um, uh, we spent a lot of that money on uh, food delivery uh, as we moved into July of that first summer uh, and stocking supplies to start the school year uh, remotely and then eventually we got to go in person when was it end of September for one group and first of October for the other group um, public school unit supplemental fund oh that's another zero um, digital curricula uh, as you can imagine especially those last three months of 20 and first three months of the fall of 20 we were uh, buying things like seesaw 
and Remind and Digital Resources, Apex for high school credits. We're buying a lot of resources uh, to prepare for remote only when we were required to be remote only. Uh, moving down to exceptional children's grants, uh, again, Brandy used that money to mainly to work with students who were behind. Um, uh, 69 specialized instructional support. Um, 169, 28,000. I'll have to look that one up. I'll look it up and y'all can ask me about it in a minute. I have a big cheat sheet over here. And then when we move into 170, that is ESSER 2, okay, that runs through fall of 23. So already out of that, uh, we spent um, a total of 2.8, wait a minute, if we look at 171, $2.8 million dollars. And that was a very extensive summer program and salaries and bonuses for high performing teachers. You remember the state made us do that. That's not the total summer school cost. I've, I have a note there at the bottom. Um, and then moving down to 178 computer based assessment. That was curriculum associates. Was that an assessment tool? Jill Barker, do you remember curriculum associates where we screen students? <coughs> to see where they were after they had been out some. That's a small number. And then um, ESSER 3, this is some of the money that goes through the fall of 24. You can see we have already spent another 358,000. That was also um, spent towards summer school uh, and highly qualified teachers. So that is a load. Um, you can see third column from the right on the bottom, a total allotment from um, spring of 20 to fall of 24 of $24,750,000. Wouldn't it be good if we could spend that on what we wanted to rather than COVID? <laughs> and amazingly enough, we've spent almost 22% of that. It's, it seems crazy to me that we've already spent that much. And it's pretty highly regulated. Uh, we do, I will tell you a couple of things and I'll stop. I know I've taken a lot of time, but I think these updates are important periodically to provide not only for you all, but for the public to know about. Um, one of the things that we think we're going to be able to do pretty soon is replace a lot of our books that were lost early on with uh, what is left in what we commonly call ESSER 1, maybe two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of books. Now because it's that high, Kim Shipman has already done some identification of those and the right ones and the reading levels and all that kind of stuff. We'll have to bid that because it's that high. So we'll start working on that. Uh, any questions? That's a lot in a short period of time. Okay, I've, I've got a question. Number 163, there's still quite a bit of funds there. How long do you have to spend that money? To the fall of uh, uh, 22, and and, and the, the books are going, are going to come out of that because uh, the 170s and 180s last longer. And then Mr. Rogers asked about um, the COVID bonus money, that is appearing in a, a code that starts with a two. I can't remember the number, 201, 203, something like that. So that will appear later when we actually receive those funds on the list. It's a lot. General, big general, big general coverage. Any questions? I know there's a lot of restrictions. Um, 
What happened with ESSER 1 that makes it more restrictive is they gave it in more lines. And so each little line has codicils, like you can only spend that little bit of money on cyber protection, or you can only spend that money on catching up special education students, or you can only spend that money on, the only real general line in that whole first block is that 163. It's a, it's a little more general, not a whole lot more general, in uh, the seven, uh, in the uh, uh, 170 codes and the 180 codes simply because there are fewer of them. And so the descriptions are a little bit broader. I think we will. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Dr. Putnam's reminded me that we, we had, we, and he's talked to at least buildings and grounds about this. We, we have had some supply chain issues. And so there are some things that we, you know, can't do right now, but, but we will be able to do. Uh, and then there are some things that we think we can start doing because we've gone through the initial PPE and we've added laptops and we've done it one, we've done a couple summer um, catch-ups, but m mainly uh, this last summer. Uh, and I think uh, everything goes well, we can, we can spend some money on HVAC and things like that. Any other questions? Yeah, Jill makes a good point. Some of these lines you have to apply for them. Um, that they, they don't just automatically come. Um, you have to apply for that money, and we're we're in the process of doing that. Yeah, um, 176 and 177 and SR2, those are summer monies that we'll use this year, but they just don't automatically give that. We had to submit a plan, what we wanted to do with those two pots of money, and um, we'll formalize that plan that will be due, but that's why it's showing up, because that got approved. So districts, they are having to meet these deadlines and submit plans if you want access to it, if you get approval. Next thing, I, uh, uh, my name and uh, Mr. Hines are both on there. Really, he, I'll, I'll let him talk mainly about the contracts. We went back, uh, talked to the principals uh, uh, association about the the, the principals about uh, getting substitutes. We had the discussion with you all, um, uh, Mr. Burnett's the current principal. The Principals Association, so we talked to him in individual groups and then uh, also had him check back with them. We talked again last Wednesday about this, and our folks uh, have a pretty good consensus that they want to give this a try. Uh, we, we still think this is one of our biggest problems, securing substitutes, and I'll let Mr. Hines detail the uh, uh, memorandum of understanding or the M the MOU um, that he has been working on and negotiating with and then if you all are okay with all this we'll bring this to you Monday for approval. Mr. Hines. Thank you Dr. Nolte. Good evening board members. Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. The um, contract that we negotiated with um, ESS if you remember we talked about this in a previous work session. Uh, this contract just includes teacher substitutes, uh, custodian, and child nutrition substitutes. We did not ask them to include uh, TAs as part of their employees, uh, nor custodians. And you know, we'd, we'd talked to you about that last time as a one of their suggestions that would help save money on the contract and help us fill those positions on a permanent basis. Um, but we, you know, we heard you and we 
went back and looked at it more and it it just didn't feel right to do that right now uh, later on uh, if this works out well with ESS then we might go back and consider that with your permission but uh, right now TAs would not be included in this uh, as permanent em employees for ESS they will remain with us so um, I think Ms. King has shared the contract with you as an attachment so if you want to look at it but uh, essentially what it what it does is it uh, authorizes ESS to provide substitutes to Haywood County Schools it would use the same platform that we currently use as uh, ASOP is what it used to be called Subfinder uh, there's lots of names for it uh, Frontline, the company that owns it, actually calls it Absence Management now. Uh, that's the latest name for it. But all of our teachers currently have accounts in uh, the Frontline system. All the substitutes currently have accounts, and basically what we would do is turn over our account in Frontline to ESS. They would pay that fee each year, which is about $15,000. Uh, and they would continue to use that system which they use all over uh, in all their uh, school districts that they have contracts with uh, so n not a lot would change as far as what teachers see what substitutes see as far as how the system works uh, teachers would still have the ability to select five substitutes that they prefer the ones that they like we call them favorites uh, in the system those five if a teacher puts an absence into the system and it's more than 24 hours in the future then only those five favorites can see that uh, absence in the system for 24 hours um, they are also sent an email directly letting them know that it's there if they do not accept it the job within 24 hours then it goes to the to the broad range of substitutes and anyone can pick it up uh, if it gets within 24 hours of the absence if it's next week and it you know next Wednesday and it gets to Tuesday then it's going to start actively calling substitutes trying to fill that position and it would call anyone on the list okay and that's that's no change from what we've done in the past as far as how that system works uh, and it it worked really well the first year we had it so we think with um, ESS providing substitutes in the system that that'll work just fine um, the other thing that the we negotiated with them this week was to get the markup down another percent um, so they're they're offering us 32.5 percent markup now um, which is is lower than the other districts in our area that they serve uh, and and they lowered it another percent to get us to do a year and a half contract because we would be starting in the middle of the year so what you would be approving is actually a year and a half with them on this first contract so for example if you look on the last page of the contract uh, exhibit a they call it a licensed substitute teacher currently at the state rate makes $103 a day so with ESS it would be $136.48 at the 32.5 percent markup uh, the custodians and food service uh, we went ahead and had them figure that at the $13 an hour rate uh, because that's what the state has us going to so we just went ahead and had them figure it at that rate uh, so those both would be uh, $17.62 an hour if they provide them as a substitute. And that's what we pay them? That's what we would pay ESS and they would pay the, the substitute $13 an hour. Um, so what we would currently do, what we would do is take our, our current subs and uh, ESS would offer them a position with ESS as a substitute uh, they would have to do very little they would have to do an orientation with ESS and they would talk to them about their company policies and so forth uh, 
uh, but they would they would be guaranteed a job with ESS, the ones that we currently have on our list. Uh, they would start onboarding them in January. Um, they would continue working as they currently are in the same way until ESS is fully on board and then they would switch over to them. Uh, they would provide a coordinator uh, that they hire uh, as their employee, we would be able to choose who that is, but they would hire them as their employee, they, as a full-time person to manage the substitute system for Haywood County Schools. And that person would sit in our central office. So I could walk down the hall and talk to them. Dr. Nolte could, Ms. Barker, Dr. Putnam, all our principals could call them here. They're not calling them in New Jersey or Raleigh or anywhere else. And uh, that person would be responsible for coordinating the system and coordinating the recruiting for our our actual our district. We we have posted these on the Moodle under the work session and the board session. If you want to read the entirety of it before Monday, there's there's 13 pages of it, so I <laughs> I wasn't going to read it to you, but uh, I'm just trying to give you the highlights of of what we've talked to them about. Uh, so so that that person would be hired to manage the system here in Haywood County um, our principals would have final say on who is allowed to come in their building uh, if a substitute does something that we don't like uh, ESS would like for us to use a graduate discipline program which we already do you know unless they do something to harm a child or steal money or something like that they would want to be able to retrain them and send them back um, for minor offenses um, you know once it got to two or three you you know we could insist that they go and that's kind of how we do it now uh, but principals could say you can employ this person but I don't want them in my school uh, and, and we could use them in other schools if other principals agree now, if they, you know, if they did something egregious enough that we didn't want them in the district at all, we could also say that. Um, so we do have a good bit of control um, as to who comes in the buildings and who doesn't. Uh, they will train them according to their program, but they will include anything that we want included in the training. So if there's special security training Dr. Putnam wants or something special Miss Barker wants. As far as curriculum goes, they will train them on that as well before they send them to us. So that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Now on the custodian uh, child nutrition side, again, they safe serve training, all the stuff for child nu uh, nutrition they will provide before they come to us. Uh, custodial, they'll train them on that. Uh, course if there's anything special that we want uh, they'll train them on that as well and provide the the substitutes for that uh, area as well one one other note even though they have a year and a half contract to start with that rolls we have a 60-day out clause so if we have a good reason we can get out in 60 days Okay, that that was one of, that was my one of my questions. The other one is an exit strategy to end. For instance, if at the end of the year and a half you don't renew, or if you pull the plug with a 60-day notice, do all of those people that they have hired or that we've do they come back to the system? Tell me about that. The the way the contract's written, we can rehire them as our employees or our substitutes if if the substitute wanted to do that. There's no clause where we couldn't bring them back to us if we want. And that's why we went with 60 days rather than 30 days is to give us time to make that transition back to us if, if that's what we decided to do at some point. If, if we wanted one of their employees, and Jason will tell you they don't mind being our recruiter for us, uh, they don't want us to hire them until they've worked with them for 90 days. If we try to hire them before we work before they work with them for 90 days then we'd have to pay them a fee but that's that's if we're still with them and we love one of their subs and want to hire them as a 
whatever. Yeah. And they, they need to have worked with them for 90 days. And then after that, they're glad for us to hire them. And they actually encourage that. Uh, they want to be our recruiter. Um, if you hire them before the 90 days, the fee is $1,250. Uh, we negotiated that down from 3500 um, So if, if we really wanted to hire them before 90 days, we would pay the 1250 After 90 days, there's no fee. They just want a little time to recover the cost of recruiting and training before we take them. Are they still going to offer like health benefits and bonuses and all that other stuff you talked about? They do. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I emailed all of you their benefits manual that you could look at. Um, they do a 401k system that, that any of the substitutes can participate in. They will match up to 3% of that, whatever they put in. Um, on the health benefits side, uh, a substitute would have to work 30 or more hours a week, just like they would with us if we provided health insurance. So I don't know how many subs would fall into that category, but it is a possibility uh, to have insurance. It wasn't uh, the best insurance. It wasn't, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, convinced us that doing the permanent TAs with them was not a real good idea right now because that insurance just wasn't as good as ours. And their benefit as far as uh, yeah, it was about $30 a week for their highest level insurance, and the total out-of-pocket deductible was about $8,000, which for us, it's about 5000 So, um, yeah, the, the insurance is comparable, uh, but it's not as good as ours. So that was one of the reasons we decided not to do the TA, or ask you to do the TA. Um, but yes, all that is still on the table for the substitutes. Um, and they will offer uh, monthly bonuses for the ones that work a certain amount of days. They will still offer short uh, notice bonuses for taking a job on short notice. Might be a $25 gas card or something like that. But those are, they can do gift cards and things that we cannot as a government entity. So that, uh, that should help with incentives. I have talked to other districts, and they, um, you know, ESS said, you know, they wanted to be real upfront that they would not get us to a 100% fill rate. They're just not going to guarantee that. But what they do promise is a 20% improvement over what we're doing. And since Thanksgiving, we've been running in the 70s, 70% uh, 70 range for fill rates. So if they can get us up over 90, yeah, we'll be tickled to death. Yeah. Um, and other great. districts say they have been able to produce about 20% improvement. Um, I was talking to Dean Shatley the other day. He was helping me with the contract language and stuff, and, and he's done six of these with districts they represent. And um, he said, you know, as the attorney, I don't normally provide uh, references for outside agencies and, and uh but he said that these guys were really good to work with, had, had delivered on what they promised in the other districts, and he felt very comfortable telling us that this was a good idea. So that made me feel pretty good. Um, any other questions? I think you've answered a lot of the concerns we had when we first heard this, and, and I appreciate you doing that. Absolutely. I think there was some real uh, question in our minds and you've answered 99.9% .9 of those for me so I thank you yes sir anybody else have any questions or comments okay Dr. Putnam thank you I'm gonna, All right. I'm gonna step out and wash my hands Mr. Francis yes sir okay. seems like I'm always tasked with talking about pandemics or destruction so uh, lovely topics. So I, um, I just want to bring you up to date on uh, flood recovery. I want to talk about first, just for general consumption, differences in 2004 and that flood recovery and 
2021. In 2004, uh, the damage, uh, we could pretty readily assess that as long as we could show that we had 100 foot of fencing, as an example, and X number of pieces of equipment lost, we could go and replace it and send the bill and FEMA would reimburse, as long as we were replacing like for like, everything just the same. That was a pretty simple process uh, in, at that time. Fast forward, after two major floods, because if you'll remember, there were two back to back. Uh, right. The damage was the same, but increased a little bit with the second flood. Uh, they happened back to back. To 2021, they've changed their the process. You have to have, you must have engineered and or architectural plans. That's the first step. And I will tell you that those are in process right now. Uh, if you'll remember, y'all selected uh, civil design concepts as the uh, civil engineer on these projects. And he has already begun that process. As a matter of fact, we did our last walkthrough with him today, as did FEMA um, this week. Those plans are then submitted uh, for flood permitting. You have to have an approved set of plans to receive a flood permit. That's where it gets a little tricky. Will they accept the plan? Will FEMA accept the plan or reject the plan? Will they require mitigation? Will they require relocation? Those are all answers that we do not yet have. Um, what I can tell you is the, the, sur the damage has been surveyed and entered into the FEMA portal. All, of our st all that we can possibly do is in okay so if you get the flood permit based off those approved set of plans then if a structure is involved you may need a building permit as well um, so and then comes funding who's paying for it FEMA will fund plans that are flood permitted that they're promising us if we walk these steps they, and we get approved plans, they will reimburse us for the work completed, okay? FEMA funding is crucial to ball fields uh, since insurance will not cover soil or grading or mitigation measures. So if you think about ball fields, what are they primarily of? Dirt with the exception of Memorial Stadium, which has synthetic turf. All of those ball, baseball and softball fields are natural grass. And to do anything to those uh, and, and us receive funding, we're gonna have to have an approved set of plans, flood permitted plans um, for FEMA to reimburse us. It's critical that we get that. For Memorial Stadium, there's a glimmer of hope there because what insurance would cover, we had insurance on it. Now, all of, it, all of you have insurance, as do I, and they never cover 100%, uh, but we insured it as fully as we could. And so there's a glimmer of hope there for Memorial Stadium that if FEMA doesn't come through for us, uh, we can use insurance money to repair Memorial Stadium because it is a synthetic turf. Does that make sense that I make that distinction? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that said, um, all other fields, uh, they are insured, uh, but it would probably take the total insurance coverage uh, to stand Memorial Stadium back up as it was. And it may even uh, require capital reserve dollars uh, in contribution with uh, the insurance money to get it completely back as it were. If you'll remember those numbers, uh, $427,000 uh, for the synthetic turf coverage, 
750000 for all other damages. And that's for all fields in Haywood County. So um, it would, it, that would be a, a really, really tight budget, but it, it would appear the insurance would be really, really close to covering a repair or recovery at Memorial Stadium. Okay. But that also means no insurance money for repairs at any other field, if, if used that way. So you see, it's important, not only because the other fields do not cover insurance on their playing surface, nor would insurance, if we ask them to insure dirt, they are not going to insure dirt. Um, we, we can insure it. Okay, they, they don't offer a policy such as that. So it is critical on all the remaining fields that we get FEMA support. What I can tell you is we're going through the process I just outlined right at the beginning in hopes of uh, receiving FEMA funding. Um, so any questions so far? So as far as structures, fencing, structures, equipment, insurance will cover that up to beyond the amount provided for synthetic turf, up to $750,000. So if you take all of that to stand Memorial Stadium back up as is, and, and standing up, I don't want anyone out there listening to, to think, oh, the stadium's falling. That's not what I'm saying, to, to bring it back up operational be a better way to say that um, it would take every bit of insurance money afforded us to do that and that leaves none for all other facilities wasn't the fields contaminated with pollutant so isn't there some insurance you know pollutant cleanup uh, within the policy as well I mean, it's um, not going to it's not going to resurface the fields but as far as you know taking the the topsoil dirt off yeah, there may be some some coverage there for that should be uh, insurance only covers structures content or equipment and um, actually insured properties like synthetic turf okay they will not cover mitigation measures if, let's say we take our plan and and FEMA says you're going to have to raise all utilities up above flood level and they actually have already told us that all utilities will have to be two foot above flood level insurance will not cover that as far as dirt removal or bringing in dirt there was some discussion about mitigation measures that would involve berms we were told today no dirt can be brought into a floodway which is exactly where all of our fields lie. So berming will not be a possibility. So basically, we have to work with the dirt that's there. Envir there was an environmental impact, unacceptable <coughs> levels of fossil fuels contained in the dirt, and that is mitigated or remedied uh, by putting out uh, parts per million of lime, and that will correct the fossil fuels uh, contaminants in the soil okay. but as far as removing it you can't you can't okay bringing it in you can't and insurance will not, they do not insure dirt in any way or shape or form and you probably know that better than yeah. most right it's your area of expertise can you take it out and replace it that's a good question I don't know the answer to that one I mean, my, my thinking is if you take took out contaminated so many yards and brought back in so many yards of clean uncontaminated dirt could you do that yeah I, I would think it's that would be absorbent when they've given us a, a measure which is just treating it with lime that's that's a pretty minimal cost-effective way if it were contaminated contaminated so bad I might have asked that question but I don't think we've reached that good question though. limestone should take care of that though carbon source and lime it should 
interact with each other and be fun. That's correct. Yep. Uh, just uh, again, I'm just trying to sort sort through it and understand it, like m I think most people will. And you, you all probably already have this, but really we're talking about what insurance would pay for, and then if we want FEMA support, we're talking about a plan to mitigate that is permitted. Mitigate or not, or relocate. They haven't indicated to us what, what, they, what those plans will look like. What I can tell you is Civil Design Concepts has already begun that process, and they hope to have plans in front of them uh, within, the, uh, within the next month or so. So um, I know that they are working close with McGill Associates, who uh, is who was procured by the town of Canton for flood, and that is McGill will be the ones who permit for flood for our fields. And so Civil Design Concepts and McGill are already talking. What are you going to require us to do? What are we looking at here? Tell us which way to go. If you'll tell us what we're looking at, we'll, you know, we can develop those plans. So they're actively working on them. They did a walkthrough today, as a matter of fact. Once we get zeroed in on those plans, then we can know associated costs. And so, um, and as with anything um, that involves a lot of money, you have to put it out for formal bid um, and use the procurement process. So just as soon as we, we have approved set of plans, then we'll be putting those out for bid uh, for different or various contractors to bid on. All right. One thing I'd like to make a comment or maybe ask a question is, is I, I know a lot of us are starting to get questions about doesn't look like anything's happening. You know, why are we not doing this or why is this not happening? And I've tried to explain what you've told us is it's a process and if we don't follow the process then the possible reimbursement would be in jeopardy of, of that plus the fact that the coverage will not cover all the damage and et cetera, et cetera. Is that not correct? Yes, sir, that's absolutely correct. We are, uh, to be made whole, um, we're going to need part insurance and part FEMA. And as I say it, said, insurance, there are certain things they will not cover. They will not cover mitigation measures. Insurance will not cover that. So if they say raise all the utilities, which they have, two feet above flood stage, which they have, there's no money there for that. <laughs> There, and you can't even purchase insurance for it. If they say, um, if the plans to get the, the fields back level and to make repairs on the dirt, insurance will say, you do not have coverage for that, nor will we provide you coverage now or ever. So you can't insure dirt. Um, that's why FEMA, uh, if you look at the amount of grading and the amount of utility work that has to be done, FEMA has to come through to fund these things. Um, I can tell you for a fact, though, every utility at Pisgah Softball Field, Pisgah Memorial Stadium, uh, Pisgah Baseball, Canton Middle Baseball, and Canton Middle Softball, every one of those fields, the lights, to get the lights turned back on and to have power in the bathrooms and running water, every one of those utilities have got to be taken two feet above flood stage. That's what we were told today. Every door, every window must be waterproofed. So to, th these are the mitigation measures we've been told of right now and there's likely to be more. Um, what all are they? We just don't know until we get a set of plans in front of them and they go, okay, looks good. So are you telling us like, I understand the buildings, 
But are you telling us like the light poles that we just put up on the softball field, those would have to be raised? No, okay. only the service to them. Okay. Okay. I think, uh, and you correct me, Dr. Putnam, uh, I, th I think um, we, we signed the uh, paperwork to get the uh, civil design concept. C civil design concepts going um, a few days ago so I do think that based upon the plans that they developed and whether or not uh, FEMA will approve those one way or the other that when that happens I think that you all buildings and grounds the board dr. Putnam could authorize some actions. We just don't know what those are yet. We have to see the plans. Um, and so we're just waiting on those for the FEMA money, for the FEMA money. I'll, g I'll give you an example. You know, we have a community that's very resourceful. Excavators, contractors, very resourceful community. It's our land, we'll, we'll just fix it back. What we do on that property will either deny permitting or not. Because it's not just the modifications we make on our property. The modifications we make on our property in relation to flood may impact other property owners. If you'll remember the discussion about the light poles, they had to be in a specific location. They had to be so many feet deep in the ground. They could not become uh, an impediment to the water flow, creating dams and ca causing water spillover to other areas. And so the only way to make this work is to get that permit, that flood permit. It's not like uh, any other permit. We have to be provided that uh, through McGill Associates. Um, out of Canton who's doing that work for FEMA and so without that permit that means um, and, and we've talked to some county and uh, town officials and they will not let us turn the power back on without one my question will be can that be expedited so that you can get busy I mean it's I don't know how long the process is <laughs> we've just as quickly as we could what we're hearing from FEMA is we have moved far faster than any other school system they've worked with we've had it in as fast as we possibly can and it is in their court and they we had till the 11th and it's already in they have um, additional time that they they have to do something on their side uh, of the portal and then it's analyzed for what they uh, what what all the damages are the problem is the timing most of those will be deployed here real soon i believe december 17th don't hold me to that day and they'll be sent back home for the holidays and the next time they'll be looking at our information will be first of the year well i appreciate i appreciate y'all making sure everything's there on time we can't control their their timeline and that that is the frustrating part um, a lot of this is outside of our control we've looked for ways to bring it back in our control or to speed up um, to give you a few ideas of the things we've done to try to make this as quickly as possible we knew that the lead time on us on a survey I mean there's only so many surveyors in Haywood County and we knew they were scheduling six weeks out well, we scheduled them six weeks before we needed them so that we already had that work and could submit it into the FEMA portal. We, we have anticipated what at times could not be anticipated, anything we might need so that our information was sitting in there and we were waiting on them. And that's exactly what uh, y'all selected the designer and, and we had not even been authorized for the design work yet but we knew we were gonna need the plan. So we've already selected those. Uh, we put that out months ago because you, you have to leave it up for 
however many days, uh, give everybody a chance to, to put in for the projects, and then you have to select one, and all of you have to approve. That was done a month ago. And so here we are sitting in a really good ex expedited position, and it still feels like it's moving extremely slow. Yeah, uh, kudos to Dr. Putnam and Josh Meese, but you'll even remember a couple months ago, we came to you and said, we may need to pay for some architecture work or engineering work that we hope to get reimbursed from for, from FEMA, and, we're, and with your permission and okay, we'll go ahead and create some line items. And so we did that in advance too. That. And, and so literally the, the the work request that we signed a week or so ago were in the lines that you all approved I don't know a month six eight weeks ago unfortunately uh, uh, having floods before helps you do some of that anticipation that's I guess the only good thing about I having think that before. those of us that were here in 2004 we remember this frustration and yeah. So, you know, it's a slow process, but you got to do what they got you got to do. And I applaud you for moving as fast as you are. I remember that was frustrating in 2004. Very I mean, good gosh. I mean, well, I, I take no credit for the quality of the work. <laughs> uh, Josh Meese, and, um, you, if you'll remember, you authorized the hiring of an agent way back in uh, September to process all these claims. Um, Josh and his staff have worked tirelessly, very quickly, to make sure um, it was entered. Geneva Frady, Debbie Jones, they have worked nonstop logging every, if you think about the inventory for those ball fields and all the equipment and everything inside those buildings and underneath the visiting side stadium, every bit of that has to be logged or inventoried right down to the model number and serial number so if you have a pitching machine they want to know what model it was what year it was made and what the serial number is on it you can't just say we lost the pitching machine we think it was about five hundred dollars that that's not going to work that will not get you funding and so they have worked non-stop i will tell you i think it's important for y'all to hear we've looked for workarounds um, not that we would want to do anything legal or unjust, but we learned that maybe, just maybe, if we could show the softball field in existence, find a picture or anything uh, of its existence prior to 1978, we would not need a permit. Didn't work. The field wasn't there. and It wasn't a, a baseball or a softball field. It had... It, it didn't have fence. So um, if anybody out there listening wants to produce a picture of that field in existence prior to 1978, I'd love to see it. And then the permit, you kind of grandfathered in and away we go. Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so we really have looked from every angle. He said that is a long time. Yeah, it's a grandfather clause. Whew. Man. I'm out there. <laughs> Thanks a bunch. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, one, uh, I may have missed it. Did they, did they decide on a, a drainage on, is that part of the, <laughs> the you know, it you failed. going to have somebody get the, the drainage tested? and The drain field failed. Okay. The fishbone system that's under the aggregate, as well as the aggregate, um, is contaminated. It didn't say it's a complete loss. It was three foot thick. Is it that thick, or is it just? Uh... I'd, I'd say that's pretty close. Well, that's a lot. Okay. We have, and we've got some folks that can help us once we know the full scale of what we're going to be asked to do. Um, most view view that project as well. Why don't you just go out there and? tear that turf up and putting you down or why don't you clean it well if we clean it the warranty's null and void and we just paid a lot of money for a warranty 10 year 10 to 15 year synthetic turf so that's not an option 
okay, well, we'll tear it up and we'll put new turf down. Well, about the first good rain we have, and it won't disperse the rain underneath, it's going to be standing on that field, and all that contamination that's in the uh, drain field is going to be up on the surface where the kids are. That's not an option. It all has to be replaced. If we replace it without the permit, and they come in and say, you have to relocate, you've just wasted all that money on a f repairing a field that you can't be at. Because you have no power, no utilities for your bathrooms. It has to be done in the order uh, that I described. You must obtain a permit, a flood permit, first of all, through an approved set of plans. And then you move to uh, either a building permit if there's a structure involved. Then you move to funding. Obviously, we just got to follow the rules and be patient. <laughs> and, and, and I do try to be patient, and I, I'm the world's worst. I, I, I like to operate like my head's on fire, but because every I think every minute counts, but th this is just one of those things that you cannot expedite. You'll miss something. You'll make a grave error. You'll cost the school system a lot of money, um, or you won't repair it properly, and that's, that's the thing I want to avoid if at all cost. Uh, keep up the good work. They're doing a good job. Good job. Sir. Again, I take no credit. Josh and his crew <laughs> have done should. the bounty of the work. He should. You're doing your part. Mr. Francis, I don't know if you all have anything else for the next item. We did have some very, very small group discussions uh, with public health, and I just we just put that on the agenda in case you all wanted to talk about it before we did announcements and questions. So that's up to you all. I do. I would like to talk about it. Okay. Okay. I got a proposal, guys. Uh, just, just crazy thoughts. So, uh, I'd like to see us make mask optional by January seventeenth. I want to explain that. First of all, by then, everyone that wants to get vaccinated, if they want to get their child vaccinated or them personally, they've had time, plenty of time to do it. Second of all, uh, you know the holiday surge should be over by then third uh, you would have time to review and adjust seating charts as needed to provide social distancing in the classrooms fourth you'd have <clears throat> time to negotiate and talk about accurate and consistent quarantine schedules depending on the status of the student or the person An example are they vaccinated or not if they're positive or if they're close contact or if they're wearing a mask or not so forth if you had all of that laid out to where a parent could make a choice vaccinate don't vaccinate mask don't don't mask and they know what the penalties are if they're in that classroom and they're close contact or not i don't think we need to just keep on going on and on and forever and keeping these kids and, and people in masks so that's just my personal opinion one thing about it we have to vote on it every month so we'll be voting on it Monday night as well. <laughs> what was your, there was one question I had, you, did you want us to, on the vaccination or not vaccinate, that would only come into play if they were considered a close contact, is that what you were saying? Well, I'm just saying we would never, I would never want us to have any input on anybody having a vaccine. I think that's totally a parent's decision to vaccinate their child or not. But if they knew that we were gonna make mask optional in, just say, we told them now, or told them Monday or whatever that January 17th we're going to make them optional that way they've got plenty of time to make their own decisions so I don't know I mean I'm just that's just a thought because we're still got I'm still hearing tons of parents they hate them their kids hate them um, they don't want to be wearing them it's still a very controversial issue and um, I just think it's time to get them get them off the kids or get let them be let the parents and the and the children make their decision whether they wear them or not. I don't think we should be mandating them. Any other discussion? I agree with Mr. Burnett. Um, I've been looking at a lot. You look at other states. You look at that Georgia, for instance. I mean, in the Atlanta area, they have been mass optional from the day the pandemic began. 
and the superintendent down in Cobb County, he's got a lot outline. It did not make a lot of difference in whether they had them on or whether they didn't have them on in, in the cases and all that. So I'm, I'm to the point too. I'm, I mean, you know, we can't keep dictating to these to to the citizens what they. Well, I think we need to make sure that when we talk to the health department and see if they were, if they're going to go back on the 10 day, you know, quarantine that we've worked out. If they if they're going to go back to the 14. We go optional or not because i know that's sort of been the big thing with having the kids still in mask is is this quarantining and keeping the kids and are they going to quarantine the entire classes again like they started with so that's something we, we need to, to, to my really case say. there my challenge to us as a board is to stand up for our students and if we have to sue the health department to make them follow the cdc guidelines i think we go for it I don't think they have the right to continue to make their own policies and to hold our kids hostage. That's another thing, too. I think you're going to see some stuff coming through the state requesting some guidelines a little bit better on the masking options. So. Well, that's been the whole reason a lot of us have been supporting the mask is to keep them in the classroom because we knew that we'd get quarantined well i want to keep them in the classroom but i challenge the i've challenged from day one and i still challenge their quarantine uh their consistency their inconsistency and their their government overreach it's there and we need to stand up and fight for it or fight against it to be honest with you okay any other comments We'll have an interesting discussion Monday night. Yes, we will. <laughs> Very good. Um, I don't have any announcements other than uh, we do have a couple personnel updates in the first session. Correct. So we'll need to just let me make it clear, too. We'll take no action tonight. Uh, we'll adjourn from here and go into closed session. And so there'll be no action taken. Uh, tonight, but we will have closed session to discuss a couple of personnel issues. Is that correct? Okay, so we need a motion to go into closed session, please. Mr. Ro Mr. Rogers made the motion. Is that correct? And Mr. Clark has seconded it. Any questions or discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, we'll vote. All those favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? I just lied. I said we won't take any action. I took action to go to closed session. <laughs> I will say Mr. Smathers uh, is not here. I think Zebs was sworn in this evening, but he can be available if we need him. I don't think we will. It's the you know typical updates we do before the Monday night That's meeting. That's correct. Thank you.